we go ahead and get on. So Sunday, make sure you bring out your desserts, your, you know, your covered dishes. And, um, you know, if you do pot roast, you do chicken salad. If you want to do, um, what are you doing on my screen? Who are you and why are you here? Get off. Okay. There we go. I told you to go away. Get on out of here. All right. Yeah. All right. I was waiting for I was waiting so I could share it. And I told it to mute. And just I love all the joys of ha having technology that does what it wants to do. All right. So again, Sundays, all that. Um, like I said, we're going to supplement it with fried chicken. But y'all, y'all go ahead and bring if you get Korean ribs. Or, or whatever that uh, Sean would like to bring or something. Um, if you got a, if you got a favorite dish you like to make, you know, uh, who has who's a dish you like a meat dish that you like to make? Nobody has a meat dish. You're bringing a roast, all right? Oh, we can listen. We can have a roast competition. No, 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 no. I don't mind roast competitions. Okay. Well, I'll tell you yours is the best. I'll tell him him is the best. And then we'll go talk about my fried chicken, which is the best. There you go. Hallelujah. All right. If you're in the area, you'd like to join us this Sunday. We're at 6302 Walter Wright Road here in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, suburb of Greensboro. Love to have you join us. And you'll be able to uh, enjoy the great time of fellowship with us afterwards. Hallelujah. So that's Sunday morning at 1030 here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Hallelujah. Let's jump in here and um, uh, segue past, uh, pa past uh, jump back in where we left off last week. And uh, we were talking about entering into the covenant with the Father through Jesus. Talked about circumcision, how that we, um, and under the old covenant, we entered in by circumcision. Under the new, we entered in by the circumcision of the heart. Uh, there was the exchange of lives. Remember, we talked about all things ours, we're joint heirs. Um, all things I have belo belong to God because God made everything that belonged to Him available to us. Okay? Now, they, um, in theological terms, they refer to our covenant with God as a diateke, D I A T E K E, um, meaning unequal covenant, where one party has everything and the other part has nothing. And so the exchange is definitely in our favor however what god wanted out of it was us okay we couldn't bring him any wealth we couldn't bring him any uh supplies we could we he wanted us so our, everything that he had including him was made available to us hallelujah uh in this covenant but it is an unequal covenant okay so we, we can't we don't have any gold to pay the streets of heaven with and um those things so it is a diateke, D-A, D-I-A again, T-E-K-E. -E. <clears throat> so the unequal covenant. And the greater has chosen to bless the lesser. Why? For his great love wherewith he loved us. Amen? Hallelujah. His great love wherewith he loved us. Praise God. Thank God for the love of God. Thank God he loved us that much. And thank God that he was willing to um, do that for us just because he loved us. Amen? Hallelujah. So let's now move here. So afterwards, after the exchange of gifts, after the um, recognition of now we're in covenant one with another with God, and, and we're no longer alienated from God, we're made one with him through the blood of Jesus, um, one of the things that they always did, and, and as we talked about Stanley and Livingston's travels across Africa, um, was there was a covenant meal following the exchange, following everything else, they sat down and had a covenant meal. Now, understand, um, th this is documented in, a, in an old work. I, don't even, I actually don't even know if it's still in print. You, now you can, I know you can find old copies of it on the Internet, but it's called The Blood Covenant by H. Clay Trumbull. So the initial H, Clay Trumbull. And uh, he, he did this study, and it was based on the travels of Stanley and Livingston. And so what he did was he took all the he took journals and stuff about them and things they wrote, and he took that and then 
um, wrote this book because they talked so much about all the covenants they cut. And he, he, relate, he, he related that to the original blood covenants of God. Because what we understand is that a lot of the covenants, a lot of things that men do are watered down from the previous thing of, of blood covenants and so forth. And, and, some, and in some cases it became heathenistic, but it had its roots all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden. Okay? Our handshake is, uh, Jerry, you're on the front row. You get to be front row guinea pig. Our handshake mm -hmm. comes out of blood covenant. Mm -hmm. And people, remember you heard people say, my handshake is my bond. Don't sit down. <laughs> okay? But it came out of that because what they would do is they would cut the palm or they would cut the wrist. Mm -hmm. And when they put them together, they would shake the, shake the hands or whatever or grab some like this yeah. or like this, whatever. They were mixing the blood. And so, thank you, thank you, Jerry. And so what would happen, be, and at that time, when they mixed the blood, they were in blood covenant. And that force of that and that um, belief in what they were doing and through the blood covenant got passed down to where it, where we, it, 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 um, it morphed from actually cutting blood to shaking the hand. But man, when there's a time when people shook hands, it was an oath. It was, that was it. I didn't need a contract. I didn't need it in writing. I didn't need 45 documenters to si say I did that. It was their bond. Why? Because it came out of blood covenant. Okay? It, that's where its roots were. All right? And so that, that is why their handshake meant so much. Okay? Now it's, you know, I'm crossing my fingers back here. Uh, I just said what I need to say to get my vote or whatever. It doesn't mean that because we've lost an understanding of those bonds. All right. Well, even so in the church. And um, we are in covenant with God. All right. And after the, the covenant was cut and they, you know, and they would, they would do things like cut and they would put gunpowder in it and, and it would, it would heal. We would heal with that mark. They would never go away. Okay. And so they knew, when you saw their hand, you knew they were covenant with, in covenant with somebody. All right? Well, one thing that the, the final act of the ritual that we see in Stanley and Livingston's travels that uh, Trumbull writes about was the covenant meal. After they had made the covenant, they had a feast. And they all sat down together. And at that feast, you know, they, they would talk about that covenant. All right? And in doing so, that was a celebration that we're in covenant. Now, if they were to separate and go somewhere and not see each other for a month, six months, two years, five, ten years, it didn't matter. When they met again, they would rehearse the blessings and the cursings of the covenant. They would sit down and have a renewal covenant meal. And at that meal, they typically would drink grape juice or wine and have bread, and it would represent their covenant one with the other. This is why Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. All right? <clears throat> so look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm sorry. Look at Luke 22 first. I passed right over that. They weren't making a new covenant. They were just reiterating and renewing in their relationships the reality of what they already stood. Okay? In Luke 22, verse 15, it says, And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover over with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat any more thereof until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks say, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. And for I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and, and, and uh, gave it unto them and said, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, 
Supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And so they're at the meal. He is now, now, quite frankly, I don't know how they got here, but there's, there are those primarily in liturgical circles who believe that when you go to have a communion meal, that the, the grape juice is literally transformed into the blood of Jesus. And the bread is actually transformed into his blood. And, and we, we refer to it in those non those circles as transmutation. Okay? That it, they, they literally believe it becomes the blood of Jesus and the blood, body of Christ. But that we don't have a historical, biblical perspective that shows us that. Okay? We don't. Um, what the closest thing we'd have to it is an at earlier time when they when they're doing blood covenant instead of uh, maybe cutting themselves and putting their hands together they would cut themselves and drop some into the you know, get some into the the wine from both of them and they would just both drink it okay um, but Jesus said this is this you know this is not be my blood this will be my body in the new covenant so this is the blood covenant meal of the covenant he's making with and and I will make in that days I'll make my covenant with them. And I'll be their God, they'll be my people. All right? So first Corinthians chapter eleven, let's go there now. I think it's a it's a fascinating study. Um when you get we get past the religious um constraints that man have put on things. Um, there was one, one, one church or, you know, one church denomination or group or, you know, whatever, uh, when they came to America and saw the Indians cutting, making blood covenants, they were talking, they were talking about how that they had, you know, um, violated the Lord or, or done heathen district things with the Lord's table. Well, see, this practice was before the Lord's table. It's, they didn't understand it was, it was, it, when, the, when Jesus did this, this wasn't something new. They've been doing it since Adam in the garden. They've been a covenant with man since Adam in the garden. So it wasn't something new. But we've made it. They thought it's like Jesus all of a sudden made something new. No, they're at Passover. Okay? They're at Passover. Going through and really, it's like it, Passover was a renewal of the covenant meal. Of God's promise. Amen. And I always love this when you talk about, uh, you know, the death angel going through and God telling them to shut the doors within and put the blood mixed with hyssop over the doorpost, lentil, and on the doorpost. And they would go in and eat the lamb um, and leave nothing. They would eat it all. And, um, you know, if you kind of look at the door, you think, well, you put blood at the middle, at the top, and on each side, if you were to draw parallel, a parallel line and a uh, vertical line, you had a cross. You were in the, you were in, so the symbolism is there. And so when they came out, they had the blood over them and the lamb in them. Hallelujah. Glory to God. They had the blood over them and the, the lamb in them. And they were kept safe from the harms and dangers of, of life. Amen. Hallelujah. But 1 Corinthians 11, verse, um, we, we get into this passage on the Lord's table. And then remember Paul says this. He said, when you are come together, uh, verse 18, when you are coming to the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Now, that's kind of Paul saying, I'm inclined to think it's true. Because I know you guys, <laughs> you bunch of boneheads. <laughs> Paul, I just love Paul's rhetorical writing in a way. <clears throat> when you strip the King Jimmy off of it, you really do get a better, clearer picture of what he's trying to say, okay? Um, and so he says here, when you come together, uh, it is, um, I hear there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. In other words, you got, you know, those that are really the true leaders would shine, okay? When all the junk's going on, the true, the true anointed and leaders will shine out, okay? Hallelujah. For in eating, and they're talking about the Lord's table here, okay, in eating, 
Uh, when, um, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now he's going to rebuke them. All right? For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Should we get too flowery with the King James? <laughs> it sounds very flowery when we read that in King Jimmy without, you know, the kind of, Paul's being, Paul's ticked off. You're coming together and it's supposed to be, remember now, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, the Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist, uh, communion, Typically, you'll use the word communion in evangelical churches and liturgical churches. You will hear Eucharist or Holy Eucharist. Well, you won't ever hear communion. You'll hear Eucharist or Holy Eucharist. Okay? That's the terminology. They're all referring to the same thing. The Lord's table. Paul called it the Lord's table. Okay? It was a renewal covenant meal. They were coming together to be reminded of what Jesus did and of the covenant they're in with him. That's what This is a covenant meal. When we take the communion um, here at the church, it is not a Christian practice. It is a renewal covenant meal. We are reminded of the covenant we have with God. It is a sacred event. Okay? Going at classical Pentecostal, we were too busy repenting to understand what we were doing. Because if we ate, okay, I'll tell you why here in a minute. Because <laughs> it's right in here. All right? For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. Hallelujah. Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad Jesus broke his body for us? Amen. And after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament. Now, the word testament is also translated covenant. In my blood. That you, that, and it was really the old English term that represented covenant. A legal binding contract. Okay? So that's why they chose here uh, that term to use instead of covenant. They used testament because it was a legal binding contract. All right? In my blood, this do you as ye as oft as ye drink in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's cup um, till he adore uh, the Lord's death till he come. Now here we are. Let's stop here for a second. So he's saying, Paul said, I received from Jesus. The Lord told me, the Lord showed me that what he said was, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Amen. Or first of all, it talks about his body. Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, remember, we, said, we were talking about earlier how that um, when they made a covenant, they had a covenant meal. And see, Jesus, Jesus did a covenant meal before he went to the cross. Okay? This was in anticipation of what was coming. Now, every time they came together as believers, now, not every time, it was every time you meet, you need to have a uh, communion, Eucharist, or whatever. Because it's as often as you do it. He didn't say every time you get together, do it. He said as often as you do it. Okay? So if you have it every service, every time you come, okay, it's fine. Okay? I, I know, again, uh, referring to the practices of, of like liturgical churches, they pretty much have communion or Holy Eucharist every time they come together. That is part of the service. You know? Okay? Um, evangelicals usually will do have communion periodically. Both are correct. It doesn't matter. Jesus just said as often as you do it. There's no wrong. There's no right. There's no better right. Okay? The, the master said as often as you do it. All right? But as often as you do it, you are in a covenant renewal meal. So when we approach that, we're approaching it that we're not just taking communion. We are renewing or we are reminding of ourselves of the covenant that we're in. All right? Now, let's talk about a couple of things about the, about the communion table. Now, again, 
If you like Eucharist, I talk about, we're talking about the same thing. Like if you like the Lord's table, if you like Eucharist, Holy Eucharist, or communion, they're all in reference to the exact same thing. Okay? Terminology doesn't change what we're doing. Okay? The semantics of it are really irrelevant. It is, Paul called it, Paul called it the Lord's table. That's what he called it. And I'm not going to go, well, you've got to be scriptural, you've got to call it the Lord's It doesn't. It, it's what we're doing. Okay? It's the action of what you're doing. All right? But when we come together to, to take communion, um, what they did at Passover was very interesting. And they've asked Jewish scholars why they did it that way. They don't have an answer. Okay? They would have a, a leather pouches, and they would have three loaves of unleavened bread, one in each of the pouches. Okay? Now, they always took the bread out of the center pouch first. They don't know why. Because they, they believed it represented Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, why would you take Jacob first? But they do. They always took. And so when they're sitting at the table, or <laughs> probably on the ground, they were, they were not at the big table that the, you know, Da Vinci painted or whatever. Is it Leonardo Da Vinci? Yeah, okay. I've seen that. It's really cool. When they stood and looked that way, that's really cool. It's really old, but that's really cool. Okay? It's on a wall. <laughs> kind of shelter, but it's not, not even indoors, per se. And um, thank God Hitler didn't get that. All right? <clears throat> um, bombing. And so they, 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 were, they were there, probably on the floor, doing crisscross, the applesauce crisscross. If you haven't dealt with kids now in the modern age, you got it, you don't understand crisscross applesauce. It's what teachers do to the kids to get them to sit down and, and cross their legs and sit there still, you know. Um, and they and whoever's serving at that at this particular one pulls out the center one, breaks it, and passes around, they break it, and they take it. And they eat that first. Then the belief was. They would have three chalices of wine. Now, again, we've talked about the word wine in the Greek refers to either grape juice or unfermented grape juice or fermented grape juice. Okay? It, it, it's not automatically it was fermented. As a matter of fact, somebody that I know uh, was re not, well, a few years ago was over in Italy. They were talking to a winemaker, and they said the best wine is right before it ferments, which leads me to believe that that's what they were drinking because you remember when Jesus turned the water into wine? Here's what they said. Now, they, once men are well drunk, you've saved the best for last. Now, Jesus is not going to take drunk people and get them drunker when the Bible forbids drunkenness. He couldn't have made fermented wine if his, the word prohibits drunkenness and they're already drunk and he's going to add more drunk to it. Yeah, but, you know, it says, well, wine, it means it's great. there is no differentiation, okay? We don't know the difference. It would have to be context or be there or whatever because the word means the same thing. Fermented or unfermented, grape juice, all right? And, and, and one of the practices in that era was to mix fermented wine into water to purify it kill the bacteria. The alcohol would kill the bacteria in it and then dissipate. So, you know, I'm just, you know, people's fighting so hard, you know, for things. Don't fight so hard for it. Just have a good testimony. All right. Um, but they would take that out, pass it around. And then they had three chalices that they filled with wine, but they had one upside down. And, and the traditional thinking or belief was this, that when Messiah came, he would, they, they always called that Messiah's cup. That upside down chalice was Messiah's cup. And that when he would come, he would turn that up and declare himself as Messiah. Okay? And so the Bible says here in the Passover meal, then they were gathered together, you know, he said, take, eat, this is the bread. This is my body. And then he took the cup. He didn't take a cup, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood. He declared himself as Messiah. Hallelujah. Amen. 
And so they're eating that, that meal, and they got, you know, they got to be kind of going, cool, nobody's ever done that. We've been taking Passover our whole lives, and nobody's ever done that. Because why? That's Messiah's cup. Glory to God. So when we come together now, all right, as often as you eat this bread, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now remember, when we look at Isaiah chapter 55, that the Bible says, by his stripes we were healed. Amen? And very interesting, they always use what? Unleavened bread. How many know you cannot cook unleavened bread evenly? It won't do it. It has to have yeast to it. And so in order to cook it, even really to cook it, they, put, they pierce it. And because of the nature, how many looked at a cracker recently? Guess what you got? You got kind of stripes. You got light, you got dark. You got light, you got dark. And so that bread, that unleavened bread was a representation of by his stripes ye were healed. Also, at the 22nd Psalm says, they looked on him and whom they pierced. The piercings had to go in to cook the bread, but it was symbolic. See, it was, it's, there's symbol, it's allegorical, symbolic things taking place here. He's saying, this is my body. What, what body? Isaiah 55, that by my stripes you healed. Glory to God. So when we come to the Lord's table, now we use, uh, we use little crackers, but you know, you can see the pierce lines on the sides because we use little oyster crackers usually. Okay. And if we use saltines, it would still have, it would be, you know, it's kind of big to try to do communion with. All right. Um, but the, but the, little, the little oyster crackers, you can still see where the piercings were on the side before they broke them apart. And it's, it's, it's cooked light and dark all across the top of it. So we are to be reminded at this renewal covenant meal, every time we eat the bread, that Jesus is our healer. And not only is he our healer, it's he, we have a covenant of healing with him. Glory to God. Every time you receive the Lord's table, you are reminded of the healing covenant that you have with God through Jesus Christ. Praise God. That's just awesome. And so you're, you're looking at that going, he's my Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals me. I have a covenant of healing with him. <clears throat> because in the New Testament, Peter quoting Isaiah 55 says, who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Hallelujah. It's a past, it, what? it's an accomplished, finished fact that he has purchased that healing. Isaiah prophesying says by his stripes, we are healed. Peter refers to it as a accomplished deal. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so after the same manner, he took the cup, Messiah's cup, and said, this cup is a New Testament, a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So after we, are, we partake of the fact that we are healed, then we take the ratification of the covenant by drinking the, the wine, and we are reminded that we are in a ratified, sealed, eternal covenant with God. That covenant is not broken. Why? Remember what we talked about earlier in this teaching, that the covenant is between God, uh, God and the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus won't break the covenant. Well, how do I get to be a part of it? Remember, if you be Christ, if you belong to Christ, because it's possessive, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we enter into that covenant by being in Christ. And we remind ourselves at this meal that I'm in a blood covenant with God. Jesus' blood was shed. But remember, this is not the blood of just Jesus. Jesus is all God and all man in his incarnate state. So that blood that was shed was God man blood, it's already mixed. And that covenant has been ratified by God, man blood. It's on the mercy seat before the throne of God. That's where his blood is. 
What does that mean? Right before you, when you walk to the throne of God, between you and the Father is the mercy seat. And on that mercy seat is the blood of the God-man Jesus. Now don't, don't go getting weird on me on that. He was 100% God, 100% man in his incarnate state. Amen? And ultimately became the first begotten from the dead. Instead of only begotten, he then became the first begotten. And the first born of many brethren. And so there is that blood that, is a, that ratifies our covenant. And so what Jesus wanted us to do was to be reminded that we are healed. And then be reminded that we're in an eternal covenant with God. And so this meal that we take, see, I can't do this, we're going to take communion. It takes too long to explain all this every time you, you know, you're going to do, a, I mean, we'd have to do a blood covenant communion meal service teaching every time we did it if we're going to do this. So sometimes we'll brush over it lightly, but so I'm teaching you now because you need to be reminded. And Jesus made a very interesting, interesting statement. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance. It is a reminder. What Just like we talked about standing in Livingston, that when the different people who were in covenant saw each other again, regardless of how far apart those, those encounters were, six months, six years, three t months, two years, they celebrated that re reunion back seeing each other with a celebration, celebratory covenant meal. And it actually, they would rehearse the cursings and the blessings of the covenant and then take the meal. Now, the good thing is Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for, uh, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And glory to God. So we come together, we rehearse the blessings. Amen? I said amen. Why? Because it's, no, it's, it's an irrevocable, unbreakable covenant. Because it's between God and Jesus. We are in Christ. Therefore, we are partakers of the covenant by being in Christ. And so in this, in this time that we, we receive communion, we are reminded of our strong bond covenant with God. Now, another interesting thing, just I'm going to throw this little fact out there. Remember, uh, what is Abraham called? Anybody know? What's the other thing he's called? What else is he called? The what of God? The friend of God. That is a Eastern term. In the original language, that is a phraseology that is Eastern in um, writing. Eastern mindset. And it literally means this. Blood covenant partner. Abraham was the blood covenant partner of God. He wasn't just his pal. See, a lot of times, if we don't take a little time to study something and get some things, our Western mind dilutes the force of what's really being said. You know, and then we'll run off and start teaching stuff. You know, God's your pal. He's your buddy. Y'all hang out together. And we've diluted what was really being said. Yeah, he is our friend. Okay? He's the friend that sticks, Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. But the, the term is literally talking about that we're in blood covenant with him. Abraham was in blood covenant with God. He was his blood covenant partner. So therefore, he's referred to as Abraham, the blood covenant partner of God, or the friend of God. But English, the Western mindset, the Western language, uh, took that phraseology and he used that. And you've got to remember, words have morphed over time. They carried a stronger force in different periods of time than they may now. And we've talked about the word, um, different words in the English language, charity, when the King James translators chose the word charity to translate agape, you got to understand the, the, the caste system of that era, that if you, were, if you were a noble and did something for a peon, this was unconditional love because you didn't owe them anything. They were lesser than you. They weren't in your station and to do something like that for them was magnanimous. It was, you know, uh, uh, unconditional. 
So which is why they chose the word charity, to try to describe agape. Now we say charity, we think United Way. Throw some bucks in there, get to wear jeans on one, month, one day a month at work. Okay? Whatever, whatever the reward is for the, you know, the United Way drive this year. But if you, if you give to the United Way, you get this. So at school, they're trying to bribe us to do it. You know, you get to wear jeans. Uh, you get 10 little orange tags, and you got to put them on your belt when you come to work, and you get to wear jeans 10 days this year instead of dressing up. I wear jeans anyway because of my position. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um. So he goes on and says this, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So now we've got this meal, it's a remembrance meal, that points back to the cross where the blood was shed and now points to the return of Christ to catch the church away. And we're in between those events. So he wants us to be reminded in that lull of events there's not another there's not another major event that equals death on the cross and the return of christ in between now when i say death that includes death burial resurrection okay that's kind of combined <coughs> there's no other major spiritual event in between of that significance so jesus tells us as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you're Showing the Lord's death until he comes. Now, because there's not going to be a major event of that magnitude in between, the church can get lazy. The church can get off track. The church can get mentally wearied or even spiritually wearied. And so we're to come together and be put into remembrance. See, we're not getting saved at the communion meal. Healing is available. Forgiveness is available. But you're not, it, it, that's, we're coming to be reminded and to celebrate this eternal covenant we have with God. To put into per perspective the weight and the value of it in a, in a remembrance, in this blood covenant renewal meal that we refer to as all the things I've told you today that we're referring to, communion, et cetera. Now, Paul's upset. Why is Paul upset? Because they came, and when they, instead of having communion, they're over in the corner getting drunk. And then you got a family over here who only had anything to eat. Hello? And he's, a, he's aggravated with them. Because you, you've missed the whole point. This isn't Fifth Sunday Fellowship, covered dish, pastor's fried chicken. That's not what this is. Okay? You know, they were having love feasts. Except the only person that was feasting were the rich. Where's the love? If you're going to let your brother over on the other side of the church starve while you feast. See, they were missing the whole point. But, you know, the Corinthians were an interesting bunch anyway. We do know we have two copies, not two copies, two letters in, in what we refer to as the canon, um, the New Testament canon to the church at Corinth. There's internal evidence from the letters. There were four letters written. Okay? And I got have to go back and look at it and find it. But I, I've, I've done some study on that. First of all, in the first letter, he refers to a previous letter he wrote. And in the fourth letter, he refers to a letter he wrote in between. So there's, there was probably that bunch. I mean, think, think of how bad off they were. They had to have four letters from Paul. Kind of like that, that recent thing on a meme that was on Facebook, that if Paul were alive today, he'd be writing us a letter. <laughs> and I can tell you, it'd be much more along the lines of Corinthian than any other letter in there. Okay? And so they're having this going on, and he's like, when you come together, it's not to have the Lord's table. So you've missed the point. <coughs> the point is, <coughs> this is a covenant renewal meal. And then he goes on verse 27 and says this. 
Wherefore, whosoever eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation or condemnation. The word damnation and condemnation are the same Greek word. Okay? To himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Stop. Now, us Pentecostals, Brother Jerry, we take this part, and that's where we do the whole repentant thing. You get into the communion table, and you're in there going, oh, Jesus, forgive me. If I... For whatever I did, anything I don't even know I did, forgive me. And we're approaching it in fear. They missed Paul's point here. And I'll tell you where the point is. You haven't rightly discerned the Lord's body. You're not discerning what you're doing. Okay? Because this isn't a hammer you into the ground scare the daylights out of you, make you repent of everything on the planet just in case you miss something, meal. This is a renewal meal. A reminder of the covenant you have with God. Okay? And then he goes on and says this, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. All right. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Then he does go into this. Because if you rightly discern the Lord's body, the blood and the body of the Lord, you will approach this in a different mindset and understand that you're in a covenant with God. And that you as his child do what he wants you to do, serve him the way he wants you to serve. You're not sitting there repenting for everything. You are reminded of the station you have with God. Amen. Amen. And you will serve and love and do for him the way he desires. Because you've reminded that you get, you called him interesting. We don't call him we don't call him uh, Savior when we get saved. If you'll confess with your mouth, Amen, and believe in your heart. That whosoever um, says it says how's it said this way? Um, that if you'll confess with your mouth. And believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. We call him Lord, not Savior, Lord. Why? Well, this is our side of the covenant. He is our Savior. He is our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't want to get too caught up on that, you know, get, get make an argument out of it. But the fact is, when, we are, when you're born again, according to the Word of God, you confess him as Lord. What are you doing? You, and just confessing him as Lord, what are you saying? I'm acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord of my life. He is the ruler of my heart. I am now at his bidding. We're in a blood covenant. And in that covenant, to access my relationship with God, I give him everything. He gives me everything. It is not he gives me everything and I don't give him anything. What I give him is my my heart, my life, and I live in obedience to him. He's my Lord. He rules over me. Now, you've got to understand, he's, a, he's not an evil taskmaster. He's not going to put you through the mill and grind you and pound you into the dirt. He's good. He loves you. And everything he's going to do is going to be for your benefit, to your help to make you better, not to hurt you. He's not looking to hurt you. Amen. Isn't that right? Okay. And so um, he says here that he, he that eateth unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation or condemnation. What did John say? <clears throat> we just quoted it recently. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God. See, when you're eating unworthily, when you're not judging the covenant, properly, the purpose of the covenant properly, you will condemn yourself. You're, you'll be skewed in your understanding of how you relate to God. Okay? And then you know, he, said, he went on and said this, this cause many are weak and sickly and many are asleep. Let me just put that real plain English. They're dead. 
<coughs> if you fail to recognize that Jesus is your healer, that you are his servant, you're in, you're, it can kill you. I know good Christians who died because they didn't believe he would heal them. Now you hear him say this, I believe he can. I believe God can do anything. He's God. But he might be teaching me. See, you haven't rightly discerned the Lord's body. Jesus went to the cross and took your sickness and disease that, uh, that you could be healed. He did not go take all that so you could have it to, to learn some lesson. All right? Now he moves into this. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. All right? If we, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, judgment will come when you're not discerning his body. In other words, you're not doing and fulfilling the side of the covenant you committed to when you confessed him as Lord. And that was so, remember, remember, remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus? Remember that? Rich, a rich young ruler came to Jesus. Now, many theologians actually believe that was Barnabas. There, there's, there's a belief that that is actually Barnabas, you know, who, who, who him and Paul split up over Mark. All right? Um, but, you know, the rich young ruler came, and what must I do to receive etern you know, eternal life? He said, um, well, how do you read uh, uh, the law, how do you read the law? He said, well, to love the, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy might, and the, thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said, thou hast well said, among, upon this hinge all the law and the prophets. Okay? And you can clearly, quickly find out that if you love your neighbor, you're not going to commit adultery with their wife. Or if you're, if you're a woman, you love your neighbor, you won't commit adultery with her husband. If you love people, you won't steal from them. If you love them, you won't kill them. If you love God, you won't use his name in vain. Amen? You can quickly go through those things. And love is a, sup a superior law of things. Because if you love the way God said love, you won't do those things. That you're commanded not to do. All right? But if you are not fulfilling your side of the cov covenant, you place yourself under a judgment not that god actually has to go judging you and he will chasten you he will he will try to correct you he does that so you are not going to be condemned because that judgment that you put yourself under see there's a judgment on the world it's a curse on the world we're out from under the curse because we're in christ but it's still out there how do you know have you been out in the garden lately you hadn't taken care of or taken care of took him I'm used to Carolinian. That's how we talk. We took care, we're take we're taking care of it. <laughs> if you've gone out to your garden and you didn't take care of it for six weeks, you're gonna find some vines with uh, thorns in them. You're gonna find the curse. You're gonna find out you got to go till that garden by the sweat of your brow. The earth is in upheaval. Why? Because it's under a curse. We, we become bubbled from the curse by being in Christ. Amen? But if you're in disobedience and you're not walking with him or not rightly discerning the Lord's body, you get yourself out into the, out of the bubble, as it were, into that cursed world. Now, God will chasten you. What for? To get you back in. Get out of this. I mean, you got, you got to think Paul was hearing God talk sometime. Oh, ye dear idiots of Galatia. King James says, oh, foolish Galatians. J.B. Phillips. I, just, I, I have J.B. Phillips just for that one phrase. Oh, ye dear idiots of Galatia. Okay? <laughs> doesn't that, that, that doesn't sound really good. Shannon likes it. The mouth of source goes right on down that line. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's right. I got Bible on it, idiot. Oh, my. But he says here, the only reason why chastisement comes is so we won't be condemned with the world. So he brings us to this covenant meal 
to renew us and to restore us. But the people who don't discern that properly become weak, sleep, and, will die, and many die. And if we would judge properly, we would judge ourselves and our relationship to that, we wouldn't get into the place of judgment. We'd be outside that judgment. We'd be covered from that judgment because we've rightly discerned it. Hallelujah. And so, um, so we didn't rightly understand it. Now, John 13, are y'all getting anything out of, the, out of this? Okay. I just wanted to know. I can't see any reactions on Facebook. The feed didn't come up for me to click on to share. So I don't know who saw it and who's looking at it and who's with us or anything. You know, it's just messed me up. I, I get upset with our, how this Facebook thing works sometimes. John 13, 34, 33 and 30, I mean 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. So this covenant is established on the love of God. Our communion in Christ and our communion with one another is loving God and loving man. Loving God and loving man as God loves man. Hallelujah. Um, and so we have a new commandment of love. We're to walk in that love. We are to approach our covenant lives in communion, blood covenant, one with another. Now, remember when, when uh, discussing Stanley and Livingston, we talked about how that <clears throat> if one member of a tribe that was in covenant with another member of the tribe violated that covenant against that tribe, in other words, Say they were warring. They were the Hatfields and the McCoys. But the Hatfields and McCoys made a blood covenant. Said we're going to cease all hostilities. All right. We're going to stop all this foolishness. We're going to stop shooting at each other across the mountains here in West Virginia. We're not going to do it anymore. Okay. Our daughters can marry your sons and, you know, all this. But if anybody breaks that covenant and kills if a Hatfield kills a McCoy and a McCoy or a McCoy kills a Hatfield, they're gonna they're gonna rot in hell. They're gonna be have their eyes eaten out by vultures. They're gonna be they're gonna be uh, thrown into the ground where worms eat their flesh. Now I say that because that's how the, what what um, <coughs> Trumbull says in his, his recording of of, of Stanley Livingston's writings was that the witch doctor would come out after they had their blood covenant and pronounce the most god-awful curses on each other. If you break the covenant, and I mean, the th fleas of a thousand camels will infest your armpits. I mean, something. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Anybody ever heard that before? Nobody in this room has ever heard that one before? That's when I was a teenager. They said, man, fleas of a thousand camels infest your armpits. All right. You know, everybody had their own thing, I guess. <laughs> and so, um, Hatfields and McCoys have made a covenant, but Junior Hatfield hates the guts out of Bobby McCoy. Because Bobby got Ginger. And he's in love with Ginger, but Bobby got her. And he didn't like it. So he finds one day out in the woods, and he kills Bobby. Junior kills Bobby. Well, they find out that Junior Hatfield killed Bobby McCoy. And, of course, the uh, McCoys are ready to go take him and hang him from the nearest tree. <clears throat> but when they got there, the Hatfields had already hung him. Because the covenant, he broke the covenant. I'm trying to use real life you know, things here that, that we could understand because we don't understand the Zulus and the Congas in Africa. So I'm using, you know, here. Okay, they're, they're, they're the West Virginia tribes. Okay? They, they, they're part of the redneck clans. All right? But because he broke the covenant, then the, the curses of that, of the violation of that are going to come on them. So they, they went and killed him too. They went ahead and killed him. Because 
they're in covenant with them. The Hatfields are in covenant with the McCoys. And in order to appease what took place, they killed their own. Okay? Wow. Now that's, and that's what they saw happen in Africa. You know, they would, if, 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 if one of their people went and raped a, a different tribe member's daughter that they were in covenant with, they'd kill him. Not the other tribe, his own tribe. There was no protection there because they broke the covenant. They put themselves outside the covenant. <coughs> they got outside of love. And by doing so, they would have to be judged. They didn't rightly discern their covenant. It, was, it wasn't business as usual. Completely different. Okay. So now... The blood of Jesus speaks. Hebrews chapter 12. We're in this blood covenant. We've taken this blood covenant meal. In Hebrews 12, 22, it says, But ye are come into the Mount Zion, into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Remember, he's the firstborn. Um, glory to God, and to uh, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that, be that speaketh, better, speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now remember, there's a passage that states this, that the blood of Abel yet speaketh. His blood spoke for vengeance. The blood of Jesus speaks for redemption. Yes. Hallelujah. Because it's, it's a better covenant. His blood speaks for redemption. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So, there are eight things that the blood of Jesus says. Okay? That's probably more, but I got eight. All right. First, it says, well, you are justified. Hallelujah. Amen. It says, you are justified. It's, and I, I got scriptures for this. I'm going to read them all, okay? All right. It says, you are redeemed from the curse of the law. You have peace. You are God's property. You have eternal salvation. You are cleansed. You are washed. You have victory. Romans, I mean, Revelation 12, 11. Um, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, glory to God, and loving because we love not our life unto death. So these are the things that the blood of Jesus speaks. So when we come to this meal, what's God saying to us? Because you see, we're always, we forget that God speaks back to us. I love the 91st Psalm just for that one purpose. He that abideth in the shadow of the Almighty and lists all this stuff. And then he gets down near the end of the 91st Psalm and it says this. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will, God now starts speaking back. I will honor him. He goes on and finishes that. Well, on life I'll satisfy, okay? Last part of that. But anyway, I love that because it's, there's a declaration of abiding. And so man worships God. And we worship him and thank him for all the good things he does. And for all the things he's done for us. And we honor him, and, and his majesty. Um, we honor his glory. We honor him for who he is. We thank him because he's God. Hallelujah. But then God speaks back. So when we come to this renewal covenant meal, hallelujah, when you come in and you begin to take communion and you start thanking God that he's forgiven you, that he's redeemed you and he's washed you and he's kept you and he's, he's blessed your life and so forth and so on, God speaks back. Because the blood's speaking. The blood of Christ speaks. And if you'll take note of this, while it's speaking, it says, you're justified. You're redeemed. You've got peace. You're God's property. You have eternal salvation. You're cleansed. You're washed. You've got victory. God's speaking back. God's declaring back. While you're worshiping him and telling him how great he is and all this, he's going back going, you're justified. You're redeemed. You got peace. You got victory. 
You've overcome. Hallelujah. He speaks back. And so at this covenant meal, we get reminded of how great God is. We're worshiping him. And then as we're worshiping him, he's talking to you. Child, you're justified. You're redeemed. Amen. He just starts going down this list that that blood starts speaking to you. Glory to God. Amen. I mean, you're, you've got my peace. There's nothing like that. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. God wants you to have peace. You're God's property. You belong to me. Yeah. That might not mean a whole lot to some people. We got a blue tick coon hound in the family. Now, the beagles, people come around, people come up, and they're the happy breed. They got to sniff you and wag the tail. Blue, on the other hand, if you show up and go near one of his possessions, you will find out about it. He will run over and get between you and whatever it is he's possessing. Roll! Gets, I mean, he gets like crazy eyes. 90% of the time, 99% of the time, his eyes are these sad, these sweet hound dog eyes, mess with something that belongs to him. They look crazy. <laughs> then it's going, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Janie can't even get out of her chair. If Blue's at the house, when, when, when he was, you know, before Nathan moved, we took him with him, um, Jane, we'd have him out in the house because Nathan would be at work or whatever, and we let Blue out, and he if Janie's in her chair, if she tried to get up, he'd come running over at the chair. Why? She's his possession. And she couldn't move. <laughs> and she could sit back down and, and, and recline, and he'd just walk off. Her possession was back where it belonged. We're God's possession. Come messing with God's possession and see what God does. Amen? God shows up on the scene. Hallelujah. You're his property. We've got eternal salvation. He's child, you're, you have eternal salvation. You're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You've been washed from the filth, you know, of, of the past. By the washing of the renewing of your mind. Hallelujah. And you got victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. Forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. Hallelujah. Glory. So here we go. The next time we come to communion, remember as you worship God, that he's, he, his blood, you're in a covenant with him by the blood of Jesus. You're healed by his stripes. You're in a blood covenant with God. Listen to him say, you're justified. You're redeemed. You have peace. You're my property. Glory to God. You, you know, you're my possession. Hallelujah. You have an eternal redemption. You've got victory. And as we, as we discern that, his table, that, that, that time together, great joy and peace will come into your heart. Why? Because we're in a new and a better covenant established upon better promises. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? I hope you got something out of all this. Glory to God. It's time to see the offering, the Wednesday night offering. And remember, we're giving towards paying off the, the, um, the concrete or paying back for the concrete. We loaned ourselves the money. How about that? <coughs> Does that make sense? We, we want to get that money back. Hallelujah. That's, that's the nice thing about having a cash reserve. We can loan ourselves the money and then pay it back. Hallelujah. Instead of going to the bank and getting it, we just get it from ourselves. But we want to keep it there. We don't want to just spend it out and not have it. Amen. You know, and get if the next fifteen thousand dollar offering. Get there's an owning going up on the front. I'm just gonna tell you, it's going it's gonna be right out the front. Hallelujah. That's 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 our last major structural thing we want to do before we build another building. Okay, here, because it, it will really enhance the the entrance. The door and now the concrete pad going out into that parking lot even further. 
is, is helping even more and more. But that's the last, that's the last kind of thing. That will really eliminate that completely kind of what eliminate that warehousey look. Okay. The, the door did a big, 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 big change. But to have an awning on the front will it would, you know, done the way we want to do it. When I open this open open um, structure, you've seen the the uh, post with the the cross braces and the it's open with like tongue and groove as uh, under, above the uh, the rafters and that kind of stuff. You know, and it's all wood stained. That's what we want to do. So it has that that expedition church concept kind of look. All right, praise the Lord. All right, if you're ready to give. If you're giving with an envelope, grab one. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless the people as they tithe and give. Thank you. Heaven's windows are open unto them, and you empty out blessings. They don't have room enough to receive in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us tonight. Next time is Sunday, this Sunday. Again, we're having a, um, a Sunday fellowship, our fifth Sunday fellowship, covered dish, and we are also supplying fried chicken for that. Hallelujah. To add to the pot roast and the chicken casseroles and the um, garden vegetables and the Sweet, I mean, the um, um, pam pumpkin pies. This time of year, you can do sweet potato pies. And Anybody ever had sweet potato pie? Oh, yeah. yeah. How about sweet potato biscuits? Oh, yeah. See that a lot down east? They'll take your regular biscuit mix and then take sweet potatoes up and put it into the batter and mix it and then bake it. <laughs> I could draw Go get a mop, Joe. <laughs> Woo! -hoo! Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. That's some kind of good. Hallelujah. Amen. Go ahead. Let, let's, let's outdo ourselves this time. Amen. Hallelujah. What if I got to take something home? Y'all can eat on it next week. All right. Um, anybody want to help volunteer? I think we've got volunteers. That Joe needs help battering the chicken while he cooks it. Praise God. We only have 12 chickens. It's not a lot. I mean, that's a, that's a small amount. I see it as a small amount. That's not that much. <laughs> Not when I think about cooking, you know, you know, 70, 80 at a time. That, that 12 ain't nothing. All righty. Just let Joe know if you can help him on Sunday. Praise God. All right. We love you. God bless you. You're dismissed. See you on Sunday. Hallelujah. And um, have a great week in Jesus. Amen. <laughs>